Uh, a very good afternoon to everybody. This is the second slot in which we have uh, assembled for the PhD coursework uh, presentations. Uh, this is, in this uh, session, uh, the research scholars are going to make presentations on uh, the topics which are generally connected with their research area. So this is where general area of research, the broader area of research uh, within which the research scholars are working uh, that they are trying to touch upon and make uh, presentations uh, on. Uh, so we have uh, presentations in this uh, session by these uh, students. Let me share a list of the scholars and their topics. Namrata will start in this session and uh, she will make presentations on, uh, on significance of the retellings of myth on feminism in Indian English literature. Uh, then Sonaji will read on journalism and ethics. Nimesh will present on Lexus and the olive tree by Thomas Friedman. Ujaba Jadeja will make presentation on the notion of knowledge, ontological inter uh, indeterminacy of postmodernism. Uh, Mega will read on situational approach in English language teaching. Komal will make it on role of needs analysis in ESP course design and finally Puja Trivedi will read paper on Indian diasporic literature and overview. Okay. So let us start with the, the first presentation of uh, the day and Namrata now you can start with your presentation. Can you all have able to see my presentation in your slide? Can you see? Yes, we can see. Now play the PPT and we can start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my second presentation is based on significance of the retellings of myth on feminism in Indian English literature, we all are aware about our epics Ram Ramayana and Mahabharata and nowadays uh, retellings are very famous because uh, it is written by a female author of India. Uh, so that uh, female author of India uh, take, uh, take interest to write retellings uh, in the present era. So here I start my presentation. Dictionary meaning of retail. The word retailing finds entry in Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary as a work form of the main word retail. Here, here we, we have to at least know what is the meaning of retail, which is defined under the grammatical category of work as the activity to tell a story again, often in a different way. Here, here the the common meaning of retelling that uh, activity to tell a story again often in a different way. Here because the author use a variety of the technique to write the retellings because uh, uh, nowadays uh, female authors are uh, centralized um, uh, female characters uh, than uh, male characters. So here feminism also it is the major point in the retellings. Here the word is again defined as to write its sto story, tell it or present it again, often in a different way from its original form. What is retelling? Here, here I put the meaning of retelling. Retelling is a communicative activity which involves retelling of certain episodes in different form from its prototypes and as a communicative activity, it could be of two kinds. Here, here, yes, so we can uh, uh, we can understand the word of retelling. Uh, like uh, we can uh, we can all all get the story of myth uh, through orally or through with through written form. The first focus is on the story, and the later 
involves language and its notions. Literary return retelling involves reprojection of various notions uh, or a reprojection of major socio-economic or political events, individual past, national or individual history, traditional, particular, ethnic or racial stories. It could also get in the retelling of folklores, legends and myths of a specific nature and of specific nations. Since this phenomenon of retelling involves various notions, there are many equivalent terms which are suggested by literary critics and philosophers for the notion of retellings of myth. There are many similar words which are related to the word retelling. Here uh, you can see the common meaning, but some, some aspect these words are different. Reinvention, second one is reaffirmation, third one is reconstruction, fourth one is summarizing, and the fifth one is retrieval, which critics have seen retellings, uh, retellings meanings. The connection between the text and audience. Here, the audience is play a very important role, and uh, it is the main focus, and uh, a lot, lots of the authors uh, write uh, their retellings uh, uh, to centralize uh, the choice of audience. Here, Devdat Patnaik in his retelling of Indian myths in myth uh, is equal to Mithya. It is the text uh, textbook of retelling which uh, explicates these myths and legends, keeping in view those type of readers who search meaning behind myths and ritual and finally helps the myth to upright itself against the allegation of being superstitious. Here you can see uh, images. Every piece of writing should have an APE. APE means audience, purpose and effect. Function of retelling. This activity provides the author with the opportunity to reinforce certain elements of the story, such as characters, setting, atmosphere, etc and there always lies the possibilities of the conversion of the reinforcement into an attempt of propagation or to an activity which gathers support for a def defini definite overt and covert and written literary retelling also gives impetus to the development of communication strategies and oral language in post-colonial sense retelling of specific history myths, legends and folklores of a country or race may be sometimes duped as a kind of promotion of the same country or race in the global world. Literary uh, retelling as a genre. Here we can get the meaning of uh, retelling as a part of genre. The canvas of literature is painted with different attempts of telling, manifesting, contrasting and experimenting with the genres that have descended since humanity has learned the art of expressing itself. Although it is comparatively a recent phenomenon to identify or design a literary retelling as a literary genre of its own, retelling has always been the inseparable part of literary procreation. In fact, retelling has been a shelter space for the writers and authors who suffered the want of fresh plot story narrative or narrative elements here we can get a very unique things with the retelling and here we we all get the fresh uh, things like plot story and narrative to be brief in english literature one can argue that anonymous epic uh, like beowulf homer's elide and odyssey all are conscious unconscious work of inspiration or retelling Chaucer's works, whether the relatively less known, like Legends of Good Woman or World Famous Canterbury Tales, both are retelling in nature. Retelling and literature, like literature, retelling is a universal phenomena and it remains involved in some way or the other in literary outpouring. The significance of retelling in literary creation can not only be established by the fact that it has developed in a genre of its own, but by the fact that its involvement 
has affected the overall nature, category, and impact factor of the work on its audience at home and abroad. Retailing is a mechanism that provides its readers with different lenses to view an incident story or character with different angles and thus analyze the same story or character with different elevation. A retailing always enables the author to intermingle after infuse or diffuse elements from the original work to explore new dimensions of life and events. Here, what is feminist retailing? Here, feminist means the female author who write uh, the genre of retailing. The feminist retailings are the product of a twofold process of revision. First, they are generated out of the master narrative through a process of dispersal and refraction. Secondly, they are the result of the act of myth revision, a project with which has been extensively undertaken by feminists in their attempts to arrive at an alternative understanding of reality. In this context, it is important to mention that any retelling has to be preceded by the act of rereading. Alicia Ostricker's view and revisionist myth making. Here, Alicia Ostricker is a very, very uh, give good points related to revisionist of myth making. Alicia Ostricker, in her essay entitled The Thieves, Thieves of Language, Women Poets and Revisionist Myth Making, undertakes the story of the works of some American women poets in which she contends that. The old stories are changed, changed utterly by female knowledge of female experience so that they can no longer stand as foundations of collective male fantasy. Ostricker offers a definition of revisionist myth making in the following terms. Susan Sellers, a revisionist myth making second philosopher, is uh, who offers the following insight like uh, feminist rewriting could thus include ironic mimicry and clever twist as well as a whole gamut, gamut of uh, tactics that would open the myth from the inside as well as out leaving in place enough of the known format to provide evocative points of reflection for its reader but also encompassing different possibilities and other points of view here, feminist rewriting can thus be thought of in two categories and an act of demolition, exposing and de detonating the stories that have hampered women and as a take of construction of bringing into being enabling alternatives. Here, feminism and retelling, here these all are the meanings who write by female author in retellings of myth here you can see many meanings here uh, i read only one or two it uh, it counters hegemonic narratives and is commonly used as a strategy by writers with an objective revaluing the experiences of marginalized people here uh, here uh, the focus of retellings is uh, is on marginalized character like female characters of myth Marginalized voices find an identity adding currency to text and the issue of that they raise. Women writers often deconstruct traditional narratives to explore multiple views and create new narratives subverting patriarchal values. The place of women in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, both the stories of epics involved around war, sacrifices, mind games and politics romance and family values. The words conducted in both of the epics are for the rescue and revenge of women particularly. Here we all know that these two epics are uh, are mostly uh, get, un get under the idea of women and their uh, role behind the words. The role of Indian women in literature is quite wide in spectrum. Uh, here, two of the great epics, Ramayana and Mahaparata, are also in the same link and give no possibility to women for their hopes. Indian women for long have been surrounded with the pain and suffering of conventional social order. 
it can be clearly viewed that ramayana for the sake of husband's suspicion a woman has to go for exile bound to give birth and brought up her sons all alone and even after that inspections just to prove her purity she needs another man to defend the second epic like the mahabharata it is full of the exploitation of women's identity and independence where a girl is forced to be shared by five brothers being exchanged on the gamble house of the noble court indian feminism here we can find that western feminism are very famous but indian feminism are uh, but indian feminism is less famous uh, because uh, we we indian people uh, don't follow or the all of the regulation related to feminism indian mindset for feminism is nothing but an exclusive debate to discuss by limited upper class people of the society here we can get idea that indian feminism only followed by the upper class not the middle and lower class most of the indian residing in an upper city and can either converse or have knowledge about foreign cultures and language they are at least known to the term feminism but unfortunately they have a very ambiguous and disgusted picture for this concept they are skeptic of its useful and application to their real life and the indian women are significantly bound by their custom and tradition they are supposed to compel inside the ring of the male dictatorship the society which is highly categorized and based on the hierarchical concept for gender role it is quite challenging to bring equality if we note the tune of contemporary women they are still jumbled to pick the priorities of their own lives for example children or husband whether career or home making to voice up or not in spite of constitutional provisions and legend legal norms those are aiming to reshaping and strengthening women fraternity from some lakanos which causes dowry death refusal to the widow marriage and polygamy etc the role of indian women writers susi tharu and kelalitha are two indian writers who played the important role in discovering and collecting the writers by indian women they accumulated women writing from 13 languages which were being folded into volumes entitled as women writing in india 600 bc to the present voice volume one of the series 600 bc to the early 20th century is an astonishing collection of 140 selection of poetry and prose by 68 individual authors and was published in the english for the first time it is a very unique information by indian women writers they focused on the lives of indian women about their understanding of feminist literature and to bring out an india of present scenario their special attentions were on the writing of women who have been criticized and were indirectly taken about in india people has the preconceived notion from for feminism as a western rooted concept so it is completely correct but the idea of feminist theories and arguments on women's role has been originated in asian land from 6th century bc itself there we can participate in the order and become a nun writing on women education is also there from 18th century which has been written by the by a chinese scholar chen yung mei post independence women writers are these all are post independence women writers which are very very known in the present time like anita desai kamla das kamla markande bharti mukherjee nayantara sagar ruth pawa chhapwala shashi desh pande anita nayar nikita hari haran their works characteristics are modern women educated women career oriented middle class women freedom oriented women identity oriented women these all are the qualities of the works by by these all writers <clears throat> kamla das is a significant name in the space of indian feminist writings her writings included a range of genres such as 
poetry, novel, short story, and memories. Her writing were powerfully infused with an open and frank treatment of female sexuality, free, for, free from and any sense of guilt. She wrote in Malayalam and English and wrote chiefly of love, betrayal, and subsequent anguish. Her entry, her entire literary journey seemed a quest for love and dignity as a woman. Here, postmodern and feminist writers of written here, Kavita Ken is very famous, and these, uh, these all are the all are her works, uh, which uh, which all are very famous in the present times. Here, here uh, Saraswati's gift, Lanka's princess, uh, and. Uh, Ahilya, these all are related to Ramayana and Fisher Queen's dynasty and Karna's wife, the Kavita, Karna's wife uh, is written by Kavita Kane. These are related to Mahabharata. And here, other writers like Hitra Benerji, Mahashweta Devi Pratibhare, Shashi Deshpande, and Samhita Arani wrote uh, their novels related to female and centralized female character. Here you can see their text, which they all are written. Thank you. Why retelling of Ramayana and Mahabharat is happening a lot? Because this is a kind of trend that we see time and again in there. There are lots of, lots of TV series as well as popular cinema or literature which are retelling about Ramayana and Mahabharata or any other stories. So, what is the reason behind that retelling? That why it is so popular? Because it is it is a deals with a modern mindset and especially these all retellings are related to a female characters which was uh, marginalized in the original version of Mahabharata or Ramayana. And here women, uh, women writers plays plays very vital role uh, to, uh, uh, to to format and write re retellings. And here we uh, we can find only modern concept and which uh, deals with uh, present female. That's it. Uh, as you have presented about significance of retailing and your approach is feminism. So do you find any other approach or any other perspective uh, which is applied uh, while retailing other than feminism? Yes, here we can find uh, subaltern theory also which uh, added by these old writers, subaltern, Dalit, Dalit literature. Okay, uh, there are a few questions there, but you can reply in the comment. Huh? In the live stream comment, you can give the uh, answers. Yes, next presenter. Yes, slightly turn the camera upward. I will. Okay, so in my paper two presentation today, I'll talk about rise of journalism like worldwide, but I will also focus on how journalism uh, developed in India. And the most important thing is what is the importance of ethics in journalism? So 
let's like uh, have a brief idea about rise of journalism worldwide so uh, according to michael stern uh, contemporary history like uh, it's uh, only 400 years old uh, previously like uh, 250 years before people used to get paid uh, for publication of news uh, or stories uh, even in china during the sun dynasty uh, there was a like a beginning of uh, news uh, during the English Civil Wars, uh, free press was demanded. Uh, and the history starts with uh, Gutenberg to Zuckerberg. Uh, this particular tagline has been taken from uh, the short history of uh, journalism by Oxford Publication. And uh, if we continue with that, American uh, thinker Thomas Jefferson, uh, he said, like, uh, we can do without government, but we cannot do without newspapers. So he always demanded uh, the importance of uh, newspaper. He even like one of his quotations said like it is the third or fourth pillar. I forgot right now, but it is there. John Stuart Mill also uh, advocated free speech. Uh, later on, like in 20th century, uh, the era of new journalism started. So before that, like the newspaper used to get published, but later on, they have also acquired names. Okay. And the names are also very suggestive. For example, the mirror. So it's a very much, uh, you know, like a literary thing, mirror, like what is there, you can see there, the sun, the comet, the star. BBC under the leadership of John Reid, like had a tagline to inform, to educate and to entertain. So this is the importance, the role of journalism worldwide. Uh, let's talk about journalism in India. Uh, so uh, in one of the book, uh, journalism, The Rise of Journalism in India by uh, Mr. Narayan, I forgot the full name actually, Narayan. He said like uh, it started traced back in the beginning of organized, organized society. Previously, we had, uh, you know, like tribes and in those tribes, uh, uh, there was a community mukhya and uh, he used to uh, have policies his own government so he used to keep people uh, and the, the, there was uh, an appointment of a person who, who would take a big drum along with him and he would go to village to village okay and beat a drum and tell what the raja or the king wants okay and later on uh, independent agency also developed. Previously, it was uh, paid by the king, but later on, independent de agency developed. Uh, during the Ashoka period, uh, like uh, where I have read, like he used to appoint people, qualified professionals, and they used to write. But the thing was that that they were not free to publish without the permission of the king's men. So they has to they have to show the news. Like they have to produce, like this is what we are going to tell the people. And then later on, if it is okay, they were uh, good to publish. During the Mughal era, they, there was also appoint, appointment of the writer, manuscript writers. There is one incident that I have come across that Aurangzeb lost one of the Deccan battle because he was given false news. Okay, so during that time also, there was uh, fake and false news. In India, first printing press uh, in Bombay, it was uh, like uh, 1640, uh, 1674. Later on, official press started in Calcutta, 1779. It's a bit informative session. But, uh, and James Augustan Hickey, he started the Bengal Gadget. Now, the most important thing about uh, journalism is the ethics. So, Pujaba has previously asked in the first session question that uh, it was regarding uh, how can we decide. So, they have the yardstick like about their behavior, how they should behave. So, the ethic term basically it sounds plural, but it significance both like singular and plural when we talk about its construction. According to Oxford Dictionary, it defines it's a more or less connected with moral principle that governs one's behavior. Uh, whenever you are in the profession of journalism, then the, the idea of morality stands there. Uh, 
the center of journalism ethics defines that that is the one of the best uh, definition that i have got basically the word ethic is associated with the social code of conduct and, and etymologically the word ethics is derived from greek word ethos that means character so it is directly connected with character in short the meaning has something to do with virtues reliability with accepted conduct stephen j watt <clears throat> in one of the book invention of journalism ethics the path to objectivity and beyond has put several specific ideas that comes under the word ethic so what should what are the standards that a journalist should perform so accuracy verified fact free from fear there are three f free from fear and favor unbiased should leave no space for personal bias to be neutral reveal the truth now in india we have journalistic ethics and press council so recently in 2020 they have published new one this is the old one uh, but they have the yardstick like what they are they write all the ethics very well okay i am no bandharan che em kiye to chale apde so when you publish news uh, like uh, in television or in print media there should be accuracy fairness pre public verification caution against defamatory writing criticism of public figure right to privacy privacy of public figure recording interviews comment facts then suggestive guilt reporting proceeding of legislature caution criticizing judicial act reporting news pertaining to court proceeding correction right to reply obscenity vulgarity no glorification of social evil or violence covering communal disputes justified heading caste religion community reference paramount national effect interest foreign relation expose misuse or diplomatic immunity when it comes about investigative journalism the, the investigating journalist should balance openness and secrecy avoid hearsay resist quick gain avoid imaginary fact adopt strict standard of fairness and accuracy avoid crass commercialization professional misconduct plagiarism unbiased lifting of news and illegal reproduction yeah that's it thank you and these are the references that i have used my question is if journalism has its own ethics which is, which are supposed to be followed by journalists then is there any law of punishment that if these ethics are broken by journalists yeah there is they might like just like in plagiarism we have discussed like we might you know like we get we get defamed as well as we lo we lose the job so in journalism also there is but like in some situation teri bhi chup meri bhi chup kind of situation is there when there are personal gains yes my question is that that please suggest your views on the role of journalism in the era of post truth could uh, you please repeat what is the role of journalism in the era of post truth uh, i did not fact fact uh, right well, they are reliable for everything they produced so they should be very much accurate as well as they should uh, you know like uh, they should show what exactly is or based on facts rather than you know like uh, making stories or produce reproducing something or you know like uh, 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 helping somebody to to get some gain so it's very important thank you thank you very much okay there are uh, a few more questions but you can reply in the comment uh, there are a few more questions there yet okay, okay next uh, presenter is nimesh yeah it is okay of camera 
height is okay yes Today, I am going to talk about the lectures and the olive tree, understanding globalization by Thomas Friedman. Now, Thomas Friedman is one of the biggest supporters of globalization. At the same time, there are many critics also who are against globalization. But this is the title of the book written by Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat, as well as the lectures and the olive tree. So it might the pre present this presentation will be focused mainly on the lexus and the olive tree and what are Thomas Friedman's view presented in the book. So it happens that Thomas Friedman was traveling in a bullet train 180 miles per hour in Tokyo to visit Lexus car factory. He was amazed by seeing that the factory was producing 300 Lexus sedans each day made by 66 human beings and 310 robots. The human beings were there mostly for the quality control and the robots were doing all the works. So he was quite surprised when he visits Japan. So he is a journalist and as a journalist, he is visiting different parts of the world and he, he was on a tour in Japan and he was surprised by seeing that a Japanese have developed a bullet train and bullet train is running by 180 miles per hour. And after that, he visits Lexus car factory. Now you must know, you might be knowing that Lexus is one of the luxurious car in the world. And the factory when he visits, it was made, car was made mostly by robots. Humans were there, but they were mostly for the quality control and not doing the work. It means robots were doing all the work. This kind of digital, digitalization were there in Japan. And so he was returning. And while returning, he was reading that this International Herald Tribune, that is the newspaper, he was reading that newspaper. The story was about the Daily State Department's briefing. State Department spokeswoman Margaret D. Tutwiller had given a controversial interpretation of 1948 United Nations resolution relating to the right of Palestinian refugee to Israel. Now again, these two names are very familiar to you. You know very well that what is Palestine, famous Palestinian, Palestine in Israel, they are the places related to related to one of the three biggest religion in the world. This religion gets originated there. So these places are always in news about the religions. So it had clearly agitated both Arabs and Israel and spark a furor in the Middle East. So there is a tension going on in the Middle East about the religion which the story was reporting. So the Friedman comments that I was speeding along at 180 miles an hour on the most modern train in the world, reading the story about the oldest corner of the world. And the thought occurred to me that this, this Japanese whose Lexus factory I had just visited and whose train I was riding were building the greatest luxury car in the world with robots. And over here on the top of page three of the Herald Tribune, the people with whom I had lived for so many years in Beirut and Jerusalem, whom I knew so well, were still fighting who on which olive tree. So these lines are very interesting. Here Thomas Friedman is comparing the two worlds. On the one side, there is a world of Japan who is most advanced. And on the other hand, we have Palestinian. Jerusalem, these are the oldest places in the world and still there, there is a fight going on about religion. So it struck to me, Friedman writes, that Lexus and olive tree were actually pretty good symbols of this post-Cold War era. Half the world seemed to me emerging from the Cold War intent on building a better Lexus, dedicated to modernizing, streamlining and privatizing their economies in order to thrive 
for this in the system of globalization so friedman divides the world into two ways one world is a, of a lexus ek a lexus ni duniya ke che ene lexus ni duniya ne shema ras che to ke dedicated to modernizing emna desh ne vadu ne vadu adhunik banavama streamlining and privatizing their economy potana desh ne vadu ne vadu mukta arthatantra taraf lai javama so that they can survive in the era of globalization ke globalization is spardha ma taki shake at the same time ee samay ek evu pan vishwa che je shema che half the world sometimes half the same country sometimes half the same person still caught up in the fight of who owns which olive tree ek baju ek vyakti athwa to ek desh ch pote divide thayelo che ke who owns which olive tree so tamne kadach sawal thashe ke what is olive tree what olive tree represent so let's understand that in the next slide see thomas friedman writes that olive trees are important evu nathi ke olive trees is something bad they represent everything that roots us anchors us identify us and locates us in the world whether it be a belonging to a family a community a tribe a nation a religion or most of all a place called home to lexus etle shu a vastu sorry olive tree etle shu to ke a vastu jeni sathe apne jodayela chhe for example your home apnu ghar e apnu olive tree chhe our religion e apnu olive tree chhe apni caste આપણું વિલેજ આપણી કોમ્યુનિટી આપણે કહીએ કે આપણું ગુજરાત રાજ્ય કે અથવા આપણો દેશ આપણે ઇન્ડિયા સો ધીસ ઇઝ વોટ હી મીન્ટ બાય ઓલિવ ટ્રી કે ઓલિવ ટ્રી એટલે શું કે વેર વી બિલોંગ આપણું અસ્તિત્વ શું આપણા રૂટ કે આપણા મૂળિયા શું છે ધીસ ઇઝ વોટ હી મીન્સ બાય ઓલિવ ટ્રી સી ઓલિવ ટ્રીઝ આર વોટ ગીવ્સ અસ વોમ્સ ઓફ ફેમિલી ધ જોય ઓફ ઇન્ડિવિજ્યુઅલિટી ધ ઇન્ટિમસી ઓફ પર્સનલ રિચ્યુઅલ્સ ધ ડેફ્થ ઓફ પ્રાઇવેટ રિલેશનશીપ as well as confidence and security to reach out and encounter the others we fight so intensely at time over our olive trees because at their best they provide the feeling of self esteem and belonging that are as essential as human survival as food in the belly ઘણી વખત આપણને એવો સવાલ થાય કે શા માટે લોકો ધર્મના નામે ઝઘડતા હશે શા માટે બે જ્ઞાતિઓ વચ્ચે યુદ્ધ થતા હશે કે લડાઈઓ થતી હશે ઘણી વખત આવા ઘટનાઓ કે પ્રસંગો આપણે જોતા જોઈએ છીએ અને આપણને એમ થાય કે આજના જમાના પણ આવું શા માટે હિયર ઇઝ ધ આન્સર જવાબ અહીંયા છે બીકોઝ વી ફીલ દેટ વી આર કનેક્ટેડ ટુ ઇટ આપણે ગુજરાતી અને ગુજરાતી સામે અનધર આઈડેન્ટિટી આવે મરાઠી સો દેર ઇઝ અ ક્લેશ કે ગુજરાતીની સામે મરાઠી કેમ બોલી શકે હિન્દુસ્તાન આવે તો હિન્દુસ્તાનની સામે વી હેવ અગેન પાકિસ્તાન તો હિન્દુની સામે થ્રેટ છે પાકિસ્તાન તો અગેન દેર ઇઝ અ વોર ગોઈંગ ઓન same to same we can say about religion also ke ek one side we have hinduism and another there is islam or other, other religion so there is a constant fight going on and the reason is here in the phrase of thomas friedman what he says indeed one reason that nation state will never disappear even if it does weaken is because the ultimate olive tree the ultimate expression of whom we belong to linguistically geographically and historically friedman evu ke che ke nation state kyare disappear nahi thai globalization aayu tare ena critics em keta tha ke have borderless world bani jase aapu duniya ma boundary jevu ke sarhad jevu kai reshe j nahi kem ke ek bija sathe trade vyapar technology nu aadar pratan etlu budu vadhi gyu ke have aakhi duniya ek thai jase but ahiya e na pade che ke na evu kyare nahi thai ane answer shu che three word we belong to linguistically geographically and historically to other things for example linguistically to apni j vat kare to what we are linguistically bhasha ki e rite apne shu che to ke we are gujarati ane gujarati identity alag padi gayi it means ke there is other kya koi bija aavi gaya to apne gujarati hovana na te tamil telugu malayalam south ke koi any other language bhi apne apni jat ne separate kar li thi to apne ena thi alag chhe e j rite geographically જીઓગ્રાફિકલ એટલે ભૌગોલિક રીતે પણ આપણે એકબીજાથી અલગ પડી ગયા ફોર એક્ઝામ્પલ આપણે કહીએ કે અમે ભાવનગર વાળા તમે ગાંધીનગર વાળા તો આપણે અલગ પડી ગયા અમે ગુજરાતી કે તમે મરાઠી તો સ્ટેટ વાઇઝ તમે અલગ પડી ગયા અમે ભારતીય અને તમે અમેરિકન સો જીઓગ્રાફિકલી યુ આર ડિફરન્ટ એટ ધ સેમ ટાઈમ હિસ્ટોરિકલી ઓલ્સો હિસ્ટ્રી પણ આપણી વૈદિક ઇન્ડિયાથી માંડી મુગલ ઇન્ડિયા નાઉ ધ પ્રેઝન્ટ ઇન્ડિયા સો ધીસ આર ધ ઓલ થિંગ્સ વિચ ડિવાઇડ્સ આ એ વસ્તુ છે જે આપણે અલગ પણ કરે છે અને આપણે આપણા મૂળિયા નથી છોડી શકતા ગમે તેમ વસ્તુ થાય કોઈ પણ વ્યક્તિ ધર્મ છોડવાનો કહેવામાં આવે તો વી કાન્ટ બીકોઝ આન્સર ઇઝ ધીસ ઇઝ ધ ફીલિંગ ઓફ બિલોંગિંગ આપણે ક્યાં આપણા મૂળ ક્યાં છે વેર વી બિલોંગ એન્ડ ડ્યુ ટુ ધીસ રીઝન નેશન સ્ટેટ વિલ નેવર ડિસઅપિયર 
see what he says you can be a smart person alone you can be a rich person alone but for the path just a minute for that past you must be rooted in an olive olive group so there may be a questions that what does olive tree suggest see olive trees are essential to our very being and attachment to one's olive tree when taken into access can lead us into forging identities bonds and communities based on exclusion of others this word is very important exclusion of others ke jare olive tree pratyan walgan vadhare padtu thai jaye ne tyare shu thai to ke we exclude other apne ane bija e rite apne divide karta jaye and we go on killing the others and see he gives example and when this obsession really run amok as with nazi in germany the murderous om shrinkio the cult in japan sarab sri in yugoslavia they can lead into the extermination of others these are the very good examples ke jare nazi ho we all know about jews and the story of hitlers ke jare potani gnati pratyan walgan etlu budu vadhi jaye to shu thai we go on killing the other peoples apne pan ava message atyare whatsapp ma ghani vakat avta hoy ke chain se sona hai to jag jaiye ke our religion is in danger apno dharma khatra ma che apni bhasha khatra ma che jago tame phalana upar ti akraman thayu che so answer is here ke sha mate ava message apne bo effect kare che because there is a threat ek prakar no dar apne batavama aave che ke jo tame nahi jago so some other will come koi bija loko aavse ane tamari jigya e lai le che so this constant fear is there and this is the point where olive tree is dangerous એવું નથી કે ઓલિવ ટ્રી ખરાબ છે પણ જ્યારે એને એક્સેસ થઈ જાય વધારે પડતું ઇમ્પોર્ટન્ટ લોકો ઓલિવ ટ્રીને આપવા લાગે પોતાની આઈડેન્ટિટી પોતાના રિલિજિયનને એટ ધેટ ટાઈમ ઇટ બિકમ્સ ડેન્જરસ હી ગીવ્સ મોર એક્ઝામ્પલ્સ કોન્ફ્લિક્ટ બિટવીન સર્બ્સ એન્ડ મુસ્લિમ્સ જ્યુઝ એન્ડ પેલેસ્ટિનિયન્સ આર્મેનિયન્સ એન્ડ અઝેરીઝ ઓવર હુ ઓન્સ વિચ ઓલિવ ટ્રી આર સો વેનેમસ પ્રિસાઈઝલી બીકોઝ ધે આર અબાઉટ હુ વિલ બી એટ હોમ એન્ડ એન્કર્ડ ઇન અ લોકલ વર્લ્ડ એન્ડ હુ વિલ બી નોટ બી their underlying logic is i must control this olive tree because the other control seat it is only i will be economically and politically under their thumb apne shu logic apvama ave ke bija loko avshe to tame ena gulam thai jesho tamare ena gulam thai ne revu padshe tamare ena hath niche revu padshe and this is the logic people gives time and again see i will never be able to take my shoes off and relax few things are more enraging to people then have their identity or their sense of home stripped away they will die for it kill for it sing for it write poetry for it and novelize about it jo a shu thai olive tree pratyan walgan jare vadhare padtu thai jaye tare shu thai ke loko ini mate marva lage apanne gani vakat sawal thai ke sha mate suicide bomber bani ane potani jaat ne mari nakva tyar thai jata hase pan આ પ્રકારનું એને એક નશો ચડાવવામાં આવે નશો પછી ધર્મના નામનો હોય કે કોઈ પણ ના નામનો હોય એક પ્રકારની ડર બતાવી અને નશો આપવામાં આવે અને આ જે નશો છે તેના કારણે શું થાય તો હી વેરી ક્લિયરલી રાઈટ પીપલ વી ડાય ફોર ઇટ દેશ માટે ઘણી વખત લડવાનું કહેવામાં આવે તો કહેવામાં આવે કે તમે મરવા માટે તૈયાર થઈ જાઓ મા ભોમને બોલાવ્યા હશે તમે ભારત માતાને કે કોઈ પણ જન્મભૂમિ ને કે આ ભૂમિ ને તમારા લોહી ની જરૂર છે રક્ત તો તમારે વહેવડાવવું જ પડશે તો લોકો આ માટે આ રીતે તૈયાર થઈ જેતા હોય છે દેશ માટે કે કોઈ જ્ઞાતિ માટે લડવા માટે ધે વિલ કિલ ફોર ઇટ પોતે મરી પણ શકે એટ ધ સેમ ટાઈમ સામેના લોકોને મારી પણ શકે આ પ્રકારનું ધર્મ જનુન તેમ આવી જતું હોય છે સિંગ ફોર ઇટ બહુ કવિ હૃદય ના હોય તો આપણે કિંજલ બેન કેમ કે એમ અમે લેરી લાલા ગુજરાતી લાલા તો એમના ગીતો ગાશે ઘણા કવિ હોય તો ગુજરાત મોરી મોરી રે આવું કાવ્ય લખશે બીકોઝ વી હેવ ફિલિંગ વિથ અવર ઓલિવ ટ્રી રાઇટ પોએટ્રી એન્ડ નોવેલાઇઝ અબાઉટ ઇટ બીકોઝ વિધઆઉટ અ સેન્સ ઓફ હોમ એન્ડ બિલોંગિંગ લાઈફ બીકમ બેરન એન્ડ રૂટલેસ જો તમારી પાસે હોમ આ પ્રકારની ફિલિંગ્સ ને બિલોંગિંગનેસ નહીં હોય ધેન યોર લાઈફ વિલ બી ઓફ નો યુઝ અત્યારે અચાનક જ મને એક એક્ઝામ્પલ યાદ આવે છે ધેર ઇઝ અ કેરેક્ટર જ્ઞાન ઇન ધ નોવેલ ઇનહેરિટન્સ ઓફ લોઝ ઇનહેરિટન્સ ઓફ લોઝ માં એક પાત્ર છે જ્ઞાન એન્ડ હી વોઝ ઇન રોમેન્ટિક રિલેશનશીપ વિથ અ ગર્લ નેમ સાઈ એ બંને વચ્ચે એક પ્રણય ચાલતો હોય છે અચાનક એવું બને છે કે ધેર ઇઝ અ મુવમેન્ટ ગોઈંગ ઓન ઓફ ગોરખા લેન્ડ જી એન એલ એફ ગોરખા નેશનલ લિબરેશન ફ્રન્ટ અને જ્ઞાન પોતે સ્ટુડન્ટ હોય છે 
બટ વોટ હેપન્સ દેટ જ્યારે એ રેલી નીકળતી જુએ છે તો એ પોતાની જાતને કમજોર માનવા લાગે છે અને એવું વિચારે છે કે એના ફ્રેન્ડ્સ જે એની સાથે કોલેજમાં ભણે ભણે છે એ બધા લોકો આ મૂવમેન્ટમાં જોડાઈ ગયા એન્ડ ધેર ઇઝ અ ટ્રીમેન્ડ સ્પીચ ગોઈંગ ઓન એ કારણ કે નશો ચડાવી દે એ પ્રકારની સ્પીચ એના લીડર્સ આપે છે કે આપણે ગોરખા છીએ આપણા ઉપર અહીંયા પશ્ચિમ વેસ્ટ બેંગાલમાં ખૂબ અત્યાચાર થાય છે વી ડોન્ટ હેવ જોબ્સ વી ડોન્ટ હેવ પ્રોપર એજ્યુકેશન વી ડોન્ટ ઓનિંગ એની ટ્રી પ્લાન્ટેશન એન્ડ એઝ અ રિઝલ્ટ જ્ઞાન જોઈન્સ દેટ મૂવમેન્ટ અધરવાઇઝ જ્ઞાન વોઝ નોટ ઇન્ટરેસ્ટેડ ઇન એનીથિંગ જ્ઞાનને આમાંથી એક પણ વસ્તુમાં રસ નહોતો બટ હી જોઈન્સ ધ મૂવમેન્ટ બીકોઝ હી થિંગ્સ ધીસ એ નાઉ ધ નેક્સ્ટ પોઈન્ટ ઇઝ વોટ ડઝ લેક્સસ રિપ્રેઝન્ટ તો ઓલિવની શું છે એ વી હેવ અન્ડરસ્ટેન્ડ બટ નાઉ વોટ ડઝ લેક્સસ રિપ્રેઝન્ટ ઇટ રેપ્રેઝન્ટ્સ એન ઇક્વલી ફંડામેન્ટલ એજ ઓલ્ડ હ્યુમન ડ્રાઈવ ફોર સસ્ટેનન્સ ઇમ્પ્રુવમેન્ટ પ્રોસ્પેરિટી એન્ડ મોર્ડનાઇઝેશન as it played out in the today's globalization system access represents all the burgeoning global market financial institutions and computer technologies with which we pursue higher standards of living so now there is a fight between lexus versus lexus and lexus versus olive tree in the cold war system the most likely threat to your olive tree was from another olive tree it was from your neighbor coming over violently digging up your olive tree and planting his in its place the threat has not been eliminated today but for a moment it has been diminished in many parts of the world the biggest threat to your olive tree is likely to come from lexus from all anonymous translational transnational and homogenizing standardizing market forces and technologies that make up today's globalization globalizing economic system હવે આપણે એવા જમાનામાં પહોંચ્યા છીએ વેર વી આર નોટ થ્રેટ ફ્રોમ લેક્સસ ટુ લેક્સસ એક લેક્સસ ને બીજા લેક્સસ એક ધર્મ ને બીજા ધર્મ થી ખતરો નથી બટ ધીસ સિસ્ટમ ઓફ ગ્લોબલાઇઝેશન ઇઝ ડેન્જરસ ફોર એક્ઝામ્પલ આપણા દાદાની એ જતી વોટ કાઇન્ડ ઓફ ક્લોથ વી વેર વેરિંગ આપણા કપડા શું હતા આપણી ખાણી પીણી શું હતી વોટ કાઇન્ડ ઓફ લાઈફ વી વેર લિવિંગ આપણે કેવા પ્રકારની જિંદગી જીવતા એન્ડ વોટ વી આર લિવિંગ સી સો લેક્સસ ઉપર કોનો ખતરો વધ્યો છે olive tree means all the technologies and modern advancement that are happening that is doing harm the lexus and olive tree okay i am not reading this next slide the olive tree blacklisting against the lexus is the 1999 story from the france a interesting ghatna che bane che evu ke there is town council slap 100% tax on bottles of coca cola કે અમેરિકાની જે કંપની છે કોકા કોલા એની ઉપર ફ્રાન્સના એક ગામમાં સો ટકા ટેક્સ નાખવામાં આવે છે કે આ ભાગમાં કોકા કોલા વેચાવી જ ન જોઈએ સી કારણ શું છે આઈ એમ રીડિંગ રોકેફોર્ટ ઇઝ અ કાઇન્ડ ઓફ ચીઝ ઇઝ મેડ ફ્રોમ ધ મિલ્ક ઓફ ઓનલી વન બ્રીડ ઓફ શીપ ઇટ ઇઝ મેડ ઓનલી ઇન વન પ્લેસ ઇન ફ્રાન્સ એન્ડ ઇટ ઇઝ મેડ ઓનલી ઇન વન સ્પેસિફિક વે ઇટ ઇઝ ધ ઓપોઝિટ ઓફ ગ્લોબલાઇઝેશન કે રોકેફોર્ટ ચીઝ છે એને ફક્ત એક જ પ્રકારના ઘેટાની પ્રજાતિના દૂધમાંથી બનાવવામાં આવે છે એ ફક્ત એક જ જગ્યાએ બને છે એન્ડ એક જ રીતે એને બનાવી શકાવવામાં આવે છે એન્ડ ધીસ ઇઝ ધ ઓપોઝિટ ઓફ ગ્લોબલાઇઝેશન શું કે છે કે ધીસ ઇઝ વોટ વી આર અગેન્સ્ટ જે ગ્લોબલાઇઝેશનની વિરુદ્ધમાં છે કોકા કોલા યુ કેન બાય એનીવેર ઇન ધ વર્લ્ડ એન્ડ ઇટ ઇઝ એક્ઝેક્ટલી ધ સેમ કોકા કોલા દુનિયાના કોઈ પણ ખૂણામાં તમે જઈને પીવો ઇટ ઇઝ ઓલ ઓલ વિથ ધ સેમ and at the same time this cheese is made only one place and how is apne gujarat ma pan apne bahut sari rite jane ke bhavnagar to ke gathiya okhnai surendranagar hoy to tya samosa okhnai apno taste game te okro tya na aavi shake e loko game evi try kare ahiya na aavi shake but all these things like american products burger or pizza or coca cola this are the same everywhere and this is what we are against a loko em ke che ke we are against this ani virudh ma ame chhe coke is a symbol of american multinational that wants to unionize the taste all over the planet that's we are against so in conclusion i would like to say that the challenge in this era of globalization for countries as well as individual is to find a healthy balance between the preserving sense of identity home and community and doing what it takes to survive within the globalization system any society wants to thrive economically today must constantly be trying to build a better lexus and driving it into the world but no one should have any illusion that merely participating in the global economy will make their society healthy 
છેલ્લે એ જ કહે છે કે બેલેન્સ ઇઝ નેસેસરી લેક્સસ અને ઓલિવ ટ્રી બંનેનું બેલેન્સ છે ધેન એન્ડ ધેન યોર સોસાયટી કેન પ્રોગ્રેસ પણ એવું પણ નથી કે એકલા લેક્સસ થી તમે આગળ આવી જશો કે ઓલિવ ટ્રી તમે પકડી રાખો તો તમે આગળ આવી જશો નો ધેટ ઇઝ નોટ ધેરફોર ધ સર્વાઇવલ ઓફ ગ્લોબલાઇઝેશન એઝ અ સિસ્ટમ વિલ ડિપેન્ડ ઓન હાઉ વેલ એઝ યુ ટ્રાઇક ધ બેલેન્સ તમે આનું બેલેન્સ કઈ રીતે જાળવી શકો છો એ મહત્વનું છે નહીં તો આપણી હાલત અફઘાનિસ્તાન જેવી પણ થઈ શકે અફઘાનિસ્તાન ઇઝ અ શાઇનિંગ એક્ઝામ્પલ ઓફ ઇટ કે એના ઓલિવ ટ્રી ને મૂકી નથી શકતું સી એનો રિલિજિયન એની પ્રથાઓ હજી કે છે કે ફિમેલ ની એજ્યુકેશન નહીં તાલિબાની પ્રથા ને નથી મૂકી શકતું તો સી આપણે અફઘાનિસ્તાન ને કઈ કેટેગરી માં મૂકી શકીએ ઓલિવ ટ્રી કે હજી એના જૂના જે રીતિ રિવાજો છે એને જ વળગી રહ્યું છે સો એ લોકો પણ ક્યારેય આગળ ના આવી શકે એન્ડ ઓનલી લેક્સસ કે જે મોર્ડન વર્લ્ડ માં આગળ માનતા હોય તો એ પણ ના આવી શકે હેલ્ધી બેલેન્સ બિટવીન ધ ટુ ઇઝ નેસેસરી એન્ડ ધીસ ઇઝ વોટ ધ સેન્ટ્રલ આઈડિયા ડિસ્કસ ઇન ધ બુક ઓકે થેન્ક યુ ઓકે સો હુ ઇઝ સપોઝ ટુ આસ્ક ક્વેશ્ચન હિયર નમ્રતા એન્ડ સોનાજી ઓકે फीलिंग न why do you have you have you typed yes namrata you type to your question type so i can display the questions yeah who else is there why do i choose this as a presentation topic yes because this is the central idea of my phd this is the thing which on i am working that i want to see globalization and how it is affecting the society globalization samaj ne sparsh che kai rite be vachan kai connection to besadu padche ne ek baju mari core text much novel che ane ek baju globalization as a theory che so i am applying the theory in my core text ane day to day life ke india ni day to day life kai rite prabhavit thai che globalization thi to ghana logo ke che ke bhai to aapko commerce no field che commerce ni vastu che ene ene apna sahitya ne shu leva deva so i am hu e logo ne samjhavu chu ke aa leva deva che એક થિયરી ઉપર ઘણું બધું લખી શકાય એવું છે લેક્ચર્સ અને ઓલ લેક્ચર્સ બોલ સમજાયવા તો આને છે તમારો ટોપિક નથી છતાં પણ તમે લોકો એક કલાક સુધી બોલી શકો એટલો આ રીચ આ ટોપિક છે તો ધેટ ધીસ ઇઝ વાય આ હેવ ટુ સેન્ડ યસ ઓકે ઓકે देयर આર અ ફ્યુ ક્વેશ્ચન્સ બટ રિપ્લાય ઇન ધ કોમેન્ટ સો વી કેન સેવ ઓવર ટાઈમ થેન્ક યુ અ ટાઇપ યોર ક્વેશ્ચન યસ લેટ મી રીમાઇન્ડ યુ ઓલ ધેટ Uh, when uh, you have to type so i can display your uh, i can display your comment uh, uh, there are several questions there so uh, keep on answering uh, to the questions which are in the in the comment uh, give a written answer to your questions i am in between i asking polls also to keep on uh, the youtube stream so you can also reply in the poll also uh and we can try to explore the interactive mode uh, of the live streaming uh, and the live along with the presentations slightly camera down camera down
afternoon all of you uh, the topic of the presentation is the notion of knowledge ontological indeterminacy of postmodernism before we begin to understand these heavy words ontology or indeterminacy of postmodernism let us try to compare postmodernist fiction with the previous one that is modernist fiction uh, if we cannot understand what is modernist fiction we can never understand what is uh, the blurring of boundaries so if, if you have observed you will find that there were multiple detective fictions written in modern uh, age for example uh, arthur conan doyle's uh, sherlock holmes series and uh, there were multiple novels as well as short stories written on that uh, even agatha christie has written uh, a detective novels on uh, the famous detective uh, so uh, you will find that all these texts and many more are dealing with epistemology epistemology means philosophy of knowledge these texts are discussing some themes such as uh, they are discussing the question related to knowledge like how can i interpret this world i am part of what is that to be known what are the limits of the knowable and unknowability or the limits of knowledge so all these are represented as themes of modernist fiction now as the, the there was a shift in time in this post modern age you will find that there was a change in themes as well so there was a shift from problems of knowing to the problems of modes of being from epistemological questions to ontological one now uh, these texts post modernism is asking the questions such as which world is this what is to be done in it which of myself is to do it what is the mode of existence of a text and what is the mode of existence of the world it projects so after completing this presentation you are able to find the answer of the last questions which i posted here let us try to understand the meanings of these words ontology what is the meaning of ontology it means theoretical description of a universe not of the universe it's not about the particular universe but it may describe any universe and plurality of universes and to do ontology means to seek some grounding for our universe involve other possible and impossible universes for example when any artist is creating uh, or any writer is writing a novel it means he is doing an ontology it means he is describing another a uh, universe of a fiction that is a uh, imaginary world so uh, it clearly seems that he is doing ontology another word another word uh, we need to understand is heterocosm now cosmos uh, we have uh, we are familiar with this word cosmos heterocosm means alternate world or alternate universe so the world which is projected in in fiction is heterocosm means alternate world the the world which artist is creating is not his world but that is totally different one it's a, a fictional world he has created and there is a clear demarcation between this alternate world which artist has created and the world in which he belongs so after creating the another world heterocosm he is also seeking grounding for his own universe because with comparison uh, he can understand the world in which he is living uh, and this uh, heterocosm as a, a fictional world this is not a new concept even in the time of renaissance age you find that sir philip sidney has already uh, talked about this he presented the theme of fictional world as heterocosm that's another universe he also talked about poem as a sign this is what he has said the road does not go through to action means it is a fiction it is a fictitious that's not the real one means there is a, uh, a difference between the real world and the uh, fictional world 
another important matter another important theory is of heteroposum and mimetic theme these two are mutually dependent you must have heard about uh, uh, this word mimesis or uh, mimetic it means imitation the theory of imitation you will find that uh, as uh, uh, aristotle is said that uh, any art is a imitation of the real world it, it is kind of an imitation so this imita theory of imitation is telling that a uh, real world is reflected in mirror of literary mimesis it means real world is reflected in novel so uh, imitated real world is something which is imitated and the fictional world is imitation now the relation between these two is of similarity means there are some similarities for example similarity of uh, characters or some events uh, which the novelist has portrayed in the fictional world but this relation is not of identity because in the previous ages uh, previous than uh, post modern age there was clear demarcation between these two worlds the fictional one and the real one there was a clear demarcation between what is imitated and what is imitation but the confusion the problem begins with this when the novelist or any artist is portraying something uh, very much imaginative for example giants fairy uh, fairies and he is telling fairy tale there is no problem but what if when the novelist is uh, writing about some real identities or historical characters at that time there is a problem because these two worlds which are totally different than each other fictional and the real the real identities and the fictional identities they are merging with each other so the problem of the appearance and fictional worlds of individuals who have existed in the real world they are not reflected they are not reflections of real identities but they are incorporated means they are included in this uh, new fictional world and there is an overlap or interpenetration interpenetration means to uh, uh, to enter in another universe forcefully so there were multiple uh, examples uh, in post modern fiction where you find that identities are transferring or transporting from one to another uh, novels for example uh, the real identities as well as fictional identities can travel from one one novel to another one as if they are the uh, real personages or real identities uh, people used to believe artists used to believe that author is like a god because uh, he is creator like a god creator of a universe as god is also creating a universe so uh, he belongs to superior ontological level of an artist he is holding the power to uh, create the characters and the fictional world author represents himself in making his fictional world now in this post modern fictions or texts you find that author represents himself in making his fictional world it's uh, he is not just a uh, remaining author or a god belonging to another universe but he appears in this uh, fictional universe as an author himself not as a character not as a narrator only but this is the problem that he belongs to both of the universes author inside his heterocosm means inside his fictional world as well as above it so there were confusion of the identities because author becomes a character in a novel representing author himself so there was a confusion between these two worlds now this is post modernist fiction where boundaries are blurred or violated means boundaries are broken boundaries of these two worlds fictional uh, world as well as the real world or history so uh, it believes that there was no ontological grounding of any universe and that's why they don't believe in keeping the boundaries uh, till modernist fiction you have noticed that there is a clear demarcation there is a clear difference between these two 
uh, worlds, the fictional and the real. But here you find that uh, fiction and the real is most in such a way that we cannot separate it. For example, Midnight Children by Salman Rushdie. After teaching Midnight Children, there must be uh, one or two students who will ask you a question. Is it real? Are those uh, children are real or not? Because they are not able to separate the historical events and the fiction. Uh, even there is a, a, a merging of fiction and history. Author and character, author presents himself as a character as well as uh, he is author of the text. So he appears and he also uh, talks about how he is writing, about the writing process. So uh, this is very difficult. Imitated and imitation. This is very important as uh, uh, if we want to refer the mimetic theory, then uh, real world is imitated and the uh, uh, fictional world is imitation. But in this postmodern age, according to uh, Baudrillard's uh, text, Simulation and Simulacra, he is telling the same thing, that uh, the fourth stage of simulation, simulation means copying. There is, uh, there is no difference between copy and the original. So these two things are merged in such a way, real and the copy. And this is the fourth stage of pure simulation, which we know as hyperreal in which imitated and imitation both are merged. So there was, uh, there was not a demarcation between fiction and uh, the real. So because postmodernist fiction is trying to say that there is fictionality in uh, reality and uh, there is a realism in fiction. So this is the core concept of uh, postmodernist fiction or notion of knowledge that we cannot separate fictional world and the real world. Okay, so this is from my side. My question is that the heterosome and the utopian world both are similar or is there any Sorry, heterosome and, and utopian world both are similar or is there any difference between that? Utopian. Utopian, world. utopian is a, uh, it's an concept which represents ideal society. Heterocosm means if any author is uh, 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 writing, is creating any another universe, then it, uh, he is doing heterocosm. Means he is uh, creating the alternate world. Heterocosm, the word means alternate or, or another universe, which is not yours. So the fiction is heterocosm. And uh, uh, the writer uh, I mean, the universe in which the writer belongs, that is totally different. So he is doing heterocosm. Utopian is ideal universe. I mean, ideal world. That's imaginary. Can you help me in relating postmodernism with the concept of post-truth? What is the relation between both? Postmodernism uh, and post truth. There is uh, some uh, difference between uh, these two because post truth is related to journalism. As you can also apply this here, but uh, if you want to understand post truth, you find that post truth means uh, where people are making their uh, beliefs and ideas and they are making their opinion not out of logic but out of uh, some uh, personal feelings for example uh, we are making opinions with relating it to our religion with relating it to our uh, uh, caste and class then it is post-truth so it is uh, different post-modern uh, modernism is somewhere uh, you find that it is uh, different because it, it merges both the things both the things means uh, uh, not a truth and uh, lies, but it says that there is not a single truth, objective truth. It, th there is a multiplicity of truths. It's not just one truth which one can reach or we can ever know. It represents that, that there is a there are multiple truths and uh, we have our own truths. So that's totally a different concept. 
for this we need a different background to understand okay so next is mega next Is it okay? Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, second presentation topic is situational approach in English language teaching. As you all know that in English language teaching, we have a various kinds of methods and approaches to teach English language to the second language learner. So you all know that there are various approaches like uh, we can say natural approach methods in which we can say that grammar translation method direct method or we can say suggestopedia silent way but in all these method and approach here i want to focus on only one approach that is called the situational approach here is the content of my presentation first i would like to give introduction about the uh, approach need analysis target situational analysis what is the teacher's role, learner's role, what is situational approach, advantages and the disadvantages of this approach, recommendations from my side, conclusion. First, I would like to give introduction that, that the origin of the situational approach began with the work of British applied linguistics in the 1920s and 30s. So, the two leaders of this movement were Harold Palmer and A.S. Hornby. So, the oral approach and the situational language teaching. So, the situational language teaching approach is also known as oral approach. So, this approach is relied on the structural view of language. So, in this approach, the learners and the teachers should focus on the structure of the language. So, the grammar is also teach but not in a written format, but through the oral language, or we can say through oral uh, practice. So both speech and the structures were seen to be the basis of the language, and especially in the speaking ability. So this situational approach is more focuses on the speaking ability. Here, now I would like to give uh, some things uh, regarding need analysis. So when we teach to students, especially for L2 learners, for their specific purpose, at that time, as an English language teacher, we should do need analysis. So need analysis is a part of ESP, means English for specific purpose. So at that time, need analysis is very much, very much important because we know the learners need, that what learners want to know because all the students and the professionals uh, have different kinds of need to learn English language. So first and foremost thing is that, that we should know the basic requirement of the learners. So the need analysis is the formal process that is sits alongside the requirements analysis and the focuses on the human elements and the, their requirements. So here I have put three basic learners needs for example, academic needs, second is employment and the occupational needs, and the third one is communication needs. As we all know that we learn English language or as well students or as researchers, we try to improve our language time and again because it is our academic needs. 
The second point is that the employment and occupational needs. Some people are very much good in their particular field or in their discipline but they still know the language english language they have to improve because there is a need in the market so as an english language teacher we should know the need and the demand of the market so the demand is also different so we should give some kinds of a knowledge to our students regarding their basic requirements or need and the third one is communication needs we all know that in nowadays in uh, into around us we have to communicate with the various people so at that time english language is very much important to communicate with the people so at that time also we have to give importance of this skill here second point is that the target situational analysis first we should decide need and then what is the target of our uh, students so who is your target learners what do you know about your target learners goal so these are the basic questions as the english teacher we should first think about that that it deals with the analysis of a learner's target needs and mainly focuses on the student's need for example here i give in, uh, examples that the become so become students uh, learn business communications so their need is that that they have to write down the report letters a correspondence so they have to know about that but most probably what happened that they know the writing of that all these things but when uh, these kinds of inner you know, things they have to speak uh, for example in bank in other sector at the time they can't speak properly because they have no how to write but in speaking time at the time they cannot able to speak well so in medical and engineering their specific needs english for the special field so their vocab and their uh, other thing is very much different from the general purpose bivo courses in which you can also find that that there are various disciplines are there in bivo there are various courses for example hotel management in bivo and the food processing in bivo so their need of english to learn english is different so what happened that to teach english language with the help of situational language approach as a english teacher we should give or we should design probable situations to teach english language for example uh, a give task to your students practical that go to the hotel and try to communicate with the hotel management and the other persons are there then uh, go to the airport then communicate with the people with the other things uh, go to the hospital and communicate with the doctors nurse so they can learn in this probable situations that how to communicate with the people at different places so these all things are very routine but they have to learn in this approach what is the role of teacher so as the quotations mentioned that becomes a more like the skillful conductor of an orchestra drawing the music out of the performers so teacher serves as a model here teacher's role is very much important because teacher is a center in this uh, activities teacher should be a friend philosopher and guide try to uh, help uh, time in again to your students to enhance their communication skills especially english uh, speaking skill encourage students for language learning and participation in the activities and tasks uh, and uh, teachers should be a skillful pursuers and a good review organizer next is what is the learner's role learner should be a very responsive what happened that sometimes teachers work very hard but the students cannot uh, participate well so listen and comprehend what teacher says be a uh, participative and time in again ask questions if students ask questions then and they, they can learn more and more regarding that here situational approach focuses more on basically three things grammar pronunciations and the vocabulary so teaching basic grammatical patterns through an oral approach not in a written format that is very important for this uh, approach pronunciations is also very much important so give your students task that listen music uh, then read uh, more and more vocabulary also they can enhance from reading skill so these three aspects are very much important some of the uh, advantages are there and the limitations of this approach you all know that every approach and methods has their own advantages and their limitations as well so this approach also have some advantages like quality educations you can give to your students useful in a language acquisitions 
accessible methods, but in which you cannot found any risk. Best method for teaching pronunciations and the vocabulary. Good for a small and target group. This approach is not work for the big class, or we can say uh, more people. But your small target group uh, students, if you have, then you can work with this approach. What are the limitations? So first, it is sometimes it is ineffective and the boring for teachers and students. Uh, what happened that sometimes students cannot participate well at that time it will be become a very boring lack of need analysis sometimes teacher uh, can't do the need analysis so at that time it will not work well not useful for, useful for bigger classroom as i mentioned earlier for this approach you should have a collective students or we can say a specific group of people so you can uh, teach them well it is purely for language acquisitions so this approach will not help for exam purpose. So if you want to just learn English language for communication, then this approach will work very well. Lack of equipment like language lab. So these kinds of language lab and the other things, for example, tutorials you should uh, arrange. So these kinds of a task and the equipment, if uh, as English teacher have, they can they use very well for this approach. What are the tools and activities teachers can use? in this approach so in tools textbook and the visuals aids teachers can use well and for activities you can design question question answers drills or you can design listening uh, uh, per, uh, performance pictures you can show the pictures then the listening and reading both are the very much important imitations and the repetitions so these kinds of an activity uh, uh, students can learn well recommendations from the my side we all know that there are various approaches are there, but when we try to use this particular approach in our practical life, at that time, would I uh, think that to teach international, because English is not our language, it is second language. So if this language is international, so we need to establish a local situations. So then students can learn language very well. So develop indigenous model. What is the meaning of indigenous model? Indigenous means local model. You should try to design on your own model to meet local need. Selecting appropriate and natural situations so students can easily learn that. Conclusion, still today it is an ideal approach for language acquisitions but it has some limitations. But through this approach, we cannot nullify all the limitations but we can minimize some limitations and we'll use this approach in a proper way for language learning and will help to speak English in our day-to-day -day situations. So what is the basic of this approach is that the learner is expected to apply the language learned in the classroom, but to situations outside the classroom. So this is from my side. Uh, these are the references which I have used for these presentations. Thank you so much. Is it possible to teach grammar with situational approach? If yes, then how? And if not, then why not? Yes, as I mentioned uh, in the slides, that you can teach grammar to the students with the help of this approach, but not in a written format, but you should teach grammar in an oral format. So through this practical speaking skill activity, you can teach grammar. So structure is very much important. So grammar is also important, but in oral form. Yes, Pooja. Yeah. Teacher should be facilitator or tech. So I will give answer. Recording. Yes. Yes. When you speak, try to speak so we can see that the audience is Yes. 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 
Uh, yes, Pooja, please ask a question so that we can check whether your audio is reaching here or not. No, we are not able to listen. No, still not. It is muted right now. Your mic is muted. Ah, yes, now. Okay. So, a teacher should be facilitator or at the center of this approach. Uh, is it a learner-centric approach or a teacher-centric approach? That is my question. It's just the sound. Yeah, please speak something. Could you hear it? No, speak again. We are sending the sound. Hello. Still not getting the sound. Uh, yes, now speak something. Hello. Yes, ma'am. My audible mega. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, madam. Did you get my question? Yes, madam. Uh, as okay. I mentioned, that uh, teachers, uh, teacher in this approach is uh, work as a facilitator. But uh, here, what happened that there is uh, we discuss, uh, we can say as a limitation. Uh, here, sometimes teacher become very much a center. So learner centric approach, we can't say. But uh, what happened that teacher can uh, facilitate students more. So uh, this way teachers can be a facilitator as well. But uh, sometimes teachers also became, we can say, as a, a more center. So at the end, uh, it will not work properly. So some limitations are also there for that approach. OK, there are a few questions. There are a few questions sir, which uh, you can reply in the comment. No, from here, you will have to do. Here, manage from. There again, you'll have to go to start. That output can be managed from there. If you put output off, then it will not go there. Okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, give the answers. I am reminding uh, third or fourth time, but still, those who have completed and the questions which are asked are not answered by some of you still yes. so check whether if the questions are asked to you then give the response to you. okay the next uh, presenter uh, is uh, Komal okay. Very good afternoon to all. Uh, the topic of my presentation today for the general area of research is uh, role of need analysis in ESP course design. Uh, first of all, I will uh, going to discuss about uh, what is course design in ESP and how it is different from e, uh, EGP, English for general purpose. 
uh, then when we try to design the course uh, in context of ESP, there are some issues. So we will discuss issues and to solve that issues, what is the role of need analysis, types of needs, how to conduct need analysis and other types of analysis that can be helpful uh, in pro process of need analysis. Uh, first of all, uh, course design, uh, as name suggests, uh, specifically when we talk about ESP, English for specific purpose. So uh, as a, uh, uh, a course designer or as a syllabus designer, uh, uh, we should understand the language abilities or language needs of the learner. What is the requirement? What is their needs? Uh, specifically in context of ESP. So course design is basically process by which we as a designer collect data from uh, the learners regarding their need and uh, what, what kind of uh, knowledge and skill they want to achieve at the end of the course. So accordingly, we can create that uh, learning teaching environment and we can provide the materials content with appropriate methodology. So here are some principles so i'm not going into detail but the basic principles of esp course design is that designers should focus on content of specific area for example we are designing uh, a course uh, for the students uh, from engineering field and we want to teach them english in context of engineering so we have to know uh, the areas content areas of engineering for example in business communication uh, there are some uh, points given for example public speaking so uh, the point or the topic taken from the content of that area regarding business uh, talk to customer uh, convince customer negotiate with customer so content should be integrated into language aspect uh, in the course designing of esp so that is main point here Okay, the image is not visible here, but it is talking about the procedure of uh, uh, creating uh, the awareness uh, from the side of the designers regarding procedure of ESP design. So when, uh, when we try to uh, design ESP course, we should ask few questions that is known as a WH questions. So when we ask questions like who will be the learner, who will be the, uh, what will be the target situation where learners expect to learn the language, and uh, uh, what should be the situation and in specific in that why question is most important that why learners are learning uh, the language so when we address those questions or when we try to uh, keep focus on those questions while designing course that could be more specific one for the specific group of uh, language learners but in process of designing esp course there are varieties of issues so uh, I have noted down some uh, issues here uh, by my uh, through my observation. Uh, the first issue is that there are varieties of English language. For example, when we uh, uh, try to teach language to be, uh, commerce students, that is uh, having business English. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, learners uh, want to uh, doing job in uh, uh, hotel management, for example, as a receptionist, they require different lexical items, they require different discourse contexts. So there are varieties of English language. So uh, to choose the particular variety according to the need of the learners, that is one issue. Uh, second one is lack of need analysis. Most importantly, nowadays, when we try to assess ESP course, which is available, they are also designed without proper need analysis. So uh, uh, even for the general purpose, uh, English courses, need analysis is very important. That what is the need of the learners? So accordingly, we can cater to those needs. Third is there are various approach to specifically language syllabus design. There is skill-based appro uh, approach, content-based approach, uh, and uh, many more. So we should uh, un uh, understand those approach and uh, what kind of approach we are using to designing the syllabus for the specific purpose. Uh, then most importantly, there is a lack of ESP training for the teachers. Specifically on this issue, uh, I have presented a paper and I have surveyed uh, and where I talked to the ESP teachers and try to know that why uh, they are facing those issues. So uh, the common answer that I'm getting is they are lacking the proper training because teaching English to the students of general purpose and teaching English to the students of specific purpose. That is different and that require proper training of the teachers. There are also varieties of context 
uh, varieties of discourse like academic discourse, political discourse, religious discourse, which differ according to its use. So that could be uh, at the center while designing the course. There are various purposes as the name defined ESP for specific purpose. Uh, and last issue is absence of systematic criteria to design ESP course, which is not available uh, right now. So uh, with the collective effort of the designers, teachers, uh, we should conduct need analysis to solve these issues of language learners. So there we can say that the uh, solution uh, for this issue is the role of need analysis, how need analysis work. So uh, for each according to his abilities or to each according to his needs. So any kind of course here we are specifically talking about English courses for specific purpose. But any kind of course should be designed by keeping in mind the abilities of learners and their needs. So need analysis uh, in process of course design, it is very first stage or first step to design the course. So uh, it helps us to uh, address what, what kind of content we should select. For example, if we do need analysis of engineering students, so we come to know that what kind of content topics that we, we can include in uh, the syllabus of that course. And also how, how means how to teach that content, what should be the methodology. For example, if uh, the needs of the learners is to uh, be effective communicators uh, of the target language. So we should use that kind of methodology where we uh, help learners to be effective communicators, not only the language uh, learners. Uh, then need, what do we mean by needs? So for example, my need is that I want to uh, develop the ability to comprehend, to understand the message or the meaning in the target language. And also I want to produce, want to express myself in that target language. So that is my specific need. And uh, that could be other needs also. So that uh, uh, intention of learning language can be defined as a need of individual learners. Then why do, we, uh, why do learners need to learn English? This should be the first question. Uh, of designing ESP course. So uh, it is said by one of the theorists uh, that ESP professional must be prepared to find out how language is used in the real world situations and teach the language accordingly. So that could be uh, connected to the need and it should be uh, 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 the instructor should be teach uh, this aspect uh, by using various tasks. So in task we can uh, engage, we can uh, involve learners in uh, learning the language. These are various purposes that why need analysis should be used. So very first thing is to find out what language skills learner needs in order to perform a particular role. For example, if uh, I want uh, to, uh, uh, I, uh, if I want to do a job of a tour guide, so what kind of skill I require, uh, convincing skill, a negotiation skill or communication skill in general. So according to the role that uh, uh, that one should perform in the future, like if you want to be a, a cell, uh, sales manager, doctor, engineer, bank manager, or the university student or university teacher. So you require specific uh, kind of language or uh, specific kind of language skills. So to know that skill, uh, the need analysis could be done. It also helps to determine if existing course adequately addresses the needs of potential students or not. So here we can say that need analysis should not be only the first stage of course design, but it could be continuous process, ongoing process to understand the changing needs of the learners according to the time. It also helps to determine which students from the group are most in need of training regarding particular language skills. So to find out specific uh, slow learners and we can uh, teach them differently. To identify the gap between what students are able to do and what they need to be able to do. So what they are able to do uh, refers to the abilities of learners and what they need to do uh, to perform specific uh, uh, role or to uh, play specific role. So it is their needs uh, regarding future. It also helps to collect uh, information or data about particular problems that learners are experiencing. So this uh, uh, are the, some of the uh, purposes that we can uh, use need analysis for. Uh, there are various principles uh, when we analyze the learner's needs. 
and uh, in that we have to give priority first to communicative needs of the learners uh, also context of using language should be into focus uh, while designing the course and also uh, we can mention that need analysis should be done on the regular intervals uh, to update the syllabus or the course in general there are various types of needs but specifically it is divided into two types of needs target needs and learning needs uh, in short target needs refers to what learner need to do in target situation target situation situation means future situation for example uh, the students from uh, the commerce uh, uh, they have uh, a goal or aim to have a job of hr uh, human resource uh, manager so uh, according to that uh, role according to that purpose what kind of language they require to perform well in the target situation like workplace or any other uh, uh, places that we can use english for so that is uh, the target uh, uh, needs and it is divided into three uh, basic element necessities lakes and wants necessities refer to the demands of target situation for example what is demand of workplace nowadays if you see uh, the advertisement they are mentioning that our demand is the good communication skill or fluency in english or any kind of job so that is uh, the basic requirement so that necessity is referred to that demand lakes refers to what learners do not know or cannot do in english or while using english so that is the lakes and wants is more subjective according to individual learners their motivational level their readiness their attitude to learn so in short we can say that to reach out to that necessities uh, we have to fill that lakes what are lacking in the learners and that can be filled with the course of esp a uh, learning needs in general refers to uh, the need uh, to learn the language for example uh, when we say that uh, 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 some elements which uh, contribute in learning process uh, of the language for example learners they have their different styles their strategies they they require different skills for example some learner want to learn best better writing skill some want to learn uh, reading skills or speaking skills so that needs of learning language is also different so uh, according to that we can uh, design a course activities and also we can create the learning atmosphere according to the learners need uh, this is uh, steps how we can conduct needs analysis so the very first is uh, preparing a plan so before we design a course we have uh, defined some objectives which can be course objective or learning objective Uh, so that objective should be defined uh, in advance then we uh, decide the sample that which sample will be that that earlier presentation i am uh, already mentioned about sample so we should decide the sample uh, decide approach and we also recognize some limitation in conducting the need analysis and then we choose the process through which we want to collect data then we collect data analyze data interpret result and third stage is very important that what kind of data we have collected what kind of uh, findings we have so we have to use that uh, findings or uh, we can say that application of the result of data which is collected should be applicable to the course design because it is a basic uh, uh, roots on which we can uh, create the uh, course for specific purpose uh, these are uh, various types of analysis uh, so in short uh, in comparing with uh, this two types of analysis we can have better idea the target situation analysis it is kind of uh, analyze the situation uh, in the future where uh, uh, learners uh, expect to use the language either in academic atmosphere or in occupational setting at workplaces so this kind of questions we ask and we can analyze uh, the target situation like why uh, language is needed how uh, language will be used on the workplace or either at the academic uh, uh, places what could be content what uh, what could be the audience uh, uh, with with whom the learners will use the language or will communicate in future so this question uh, help us to analyze the target situation present situation refers to the present uh, condition of the learners so there we can asking question that who are the learners are there young learners or the adult learners what are the resources available to them to learn language how they learn language 
and why they are taking this course to learn. So these are some questions uh, which help us to analyze target situation as well as present situation. The last two is discourse analysis and genre analysis. In short, discourse is a, a kind of a written or spoken form of language specially connected to its social context. For example, uh, the language which is used in academic that we can define as academic discourse, uh, uh, which is similar uh, language which, you, which we use in research. So that is the research, uh, the discourse which is uh, applicable to research area. Then there is a uh, same language, but discourse is different. Like uh, English language, when it's used by a political speaker in political context, that is political discourse. So uh, there are various discourses according to its context of use. Genre analysis is uh, uh, quite different from discourse. Uh, it is attempt to explain why members of specific discourse communities employ different and specific way of using language. Language is similar, but way of use that similar language is different. So for example, uh, the academic discourse that we use in research article, conference proposals, uh, business report, grant application, a letter to editors, or dissertation in general. That is different according to its use in different genres. So these are some types of analysis. Uh, to sum up uh, and to put stress on importance of need analysis, we can say that it is an integral part of ESP course design that helps to create more effective, reliable, and applicable ESP course for second language learners and it provide relevance and validity uh, between activities in learning and final achievement of, or the goal at the end of the course. And the suggestion we can say that the need analysis should be conducted on the regular basis in order to update the ESP course according to the changing needs or the requirements of the learners. Thank you. Uh, questions are invited if any. My question is What do you think professors coming from a literary background can they design ESP, that's English for specific purposes, for example, English for science students, commerce students, engineering students? Uh, is ESP syllabus or not? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, we can say that basically uh, the teachers, English teachers are from similar background, from literature background. And we expect to teach in different fields to commerce students, engineering students, uh, even vocational students. So the solution is that uh, uh, the English teacher can uh, develop the approach to design the specific language course. Uh, but for that, they have to uh, collaborate with content teachers. Uh, for example, uh, I want to uh, uh, create. Uh, I want to design a syllabus of a vocational course specifically to hotel man management. So the teachers, content teachers who are connected to that, uh, first I have to talk with them and uh, try to know the uh, uh, the needs of learners and the area. So I can integrate that content and area in the specific designing of the course. How this uh, ESP course design will be helpful after complete implementation of NEP 2020? 
national education policy, new education policy, because I, I have read somewhere that they are also planning to um, uh, like uh, change the medium of instruction for the engineering student. I think they are planning to change it in Gujarati or bilingual, more bilingual. Uh, so is it going to be helpful for you like this case? Because you have already mentioned that this is flexible model and one keep, one can keep changing it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, even in NEP, uh, they also mentioned that uh, now onwards they will focus on skill development. And they are also promoting vocational education even from the school level. So, uh, English teaching for vocational purpose, it is also part of ESP. So, I think it will be helpful in uh, future as well because uh, now what happened that English language till now, it is treated as a subject, but it is actually a language skill. So, uh, communication skill, when we talk about it, is always connected to English because they require to communicate with the audience from diverse group. So, I think, uh, or from my point of view, it will be helpful uh, in implementation of any as well. Hello. Yes, speak something so we can check the sound. Hello, sir. Unmute from. Am I audible? Okay, I, I yeah, I, I am able to listen, but let us check the speaker here. Yes. Yes. You can start now. Uh, no, you are still not. Now is it audible, sir? Yes. Okay. So I am Pooja Trivedi. I am doing my research work on Indian diaspora short story writers. And as a part of presentation today on paper number two, which is the introductory paper of diaspora study, I'm going to present on a topic of Indian diaspora literature and overview. Let me share my screen with you. So before I begin my presentation, uh, I would like to say that we all like traveling a lot. If you have to go somewhere, we love it. You have, must have seen the Facebook post and WhatsApp messages that going on a vacation after COVID, after two years, that is enjoyment. But think if you have to go on the permanent basis, you are migrating from India to somewhere. Even uh, we have seen a uh, learn in our Sanskrit scriptures, if you move, you learn a lot. 
एंड आई रिमेम्बर अ डायलॉग फ्रॉम अ मूवी शकुंतला देवी दैट हम इंसान है पेड़ नहीं और हमारे पास पैर है छड़े नहीं सो कीप ऑन मूविंग एज अ ह्यूमन डिजायर बट when we are put in a situation that that is not our homeland we have we are st- we feel that we are stuck over there okay and then we remember nizam musicals of poem enterprise that home is the place where we have to gather our grace and in this situation the words like uh, immigrant diaspora hybridity all comes in so first of all we need to understand the word diaspora diaspora word is originated from greek verb diasporin which means scattering dispersion of something in historic origin diaspora refers to the jews with the attack on their temples jews had to scatter over the world from palestine and they were constantly feeling to go back to their homeland because going abroad is something like a punishment it is something like seen in greek and his uh, jewish origin so they think that with when we are going out of our motherland that is like a, per, a punishment for us it is a redemption and some day they hope that we will return back to our motherland in the present there are the term diaspora applied to any number of ethnic or racial group who live outside their homeland who are living abroad but when they live abroad they have different kind of feeling for example they are not at their homeland so they feel sandwiched between homeland and new land their uh, their uh, situation is like trishanku mythical figure who is hanging between hell heaven and earth so they collect all this memories of their homeland and they t- try to recreate the same thing in the host land they idealize their homeland that these things are not there for example uh, if we uh, look at the diaspora literature some of the women characters are using mustard oil instead of olive oil in foreign country so that is what they idealize homeland that this is good for us and they always uh, think that they always feel like a fish out of water they are misfit in homeland and that's why they want to come back to homeland even if they don't come back they are constantly feeling a uh, identity crisis and they want to recreate their home in the other land indian diaspora when we talk about indian diaspora it is the second largest diaspora in the world indians have settled in a pre colonial diaspora colonial diaspora as well as in post colonial diaspora when uh, indians went to abroad in pre colonial diaspora it is by force they went as a uh, uh, went for uh, some work some uh, for wages to fiji trinidad east africa during colonial times they worked uh, they went to help in some plantations in the foreign land forcefully they are sent by the english army or other people but in a modern times they are willingly going abroad as an it professionals or in medical fields but or by and large they are the second largest diaspora in the world when they go home abroad they constantly remember their motherland nostalgia is there something that we have learned in ramayan even lord ram recently we have celebrated ram navmi and we know that lord ram even could not leave abroad when his task is over so he tells uh, his uh, uh, brother that api swarnamai lanka name lakshmana rochte janani janma bhumischa swarga dapi gariyase constantly the people who are living outside the country they are like so many rams in exile in indian context and they constantly feel identity crisis of where do i belong to if they are gifted ones if they have intellectual gifts all these uh, things are transformed in writings and then the new genre upcoming in literature that we have is diaspora literature so diaspora literature is produced by the writer living outside their homeland and their writing reflects their connection with their homeland whatever they are writing about it reflects some connections with their homeland 
if we see the characteristics of diaspora literature there are some key features like it is based on the idea of homeland even if they are living in america or australia they are writing about india diaspora literature provides narrative of harsh journeys undertaken for various reasons uh, sometimes we even in real life we ask people how do you feel going abroad they wear a mask i'm not the mask of covid but face mask that we are a very happy over here but we know their harsh journeys will you go america with the dream of being a billionaire and you become a mechanic car mechanic over there so this hard uh, journeys you cannot display to others but in literature it is reflected through the writers diaspora provides account for another sense of place away from unplanned constantly even if you live there for 50 years you are an outsider so sense of place this is not my place i don't belong to here that is what nimesh has said in his presentation apna mulia kya bije chha we are constantly remembering the sense of place and recreating homeland in abroad one could read how homeland made protagonist behave in far off land either adopting or rejecting new cultural codes of the new place now here what we do in diwali we, diwali we go out of our home for refreshment we don't want to celebrate diwali in the uh, this uh, traditional way of making rangoli and sweets at home now we are modern in india and the people who live abroad they are celebrating diwali in traditional way they are celebrating navratri more enthusiastically than us so they try to create uh, something there that f- make them a feeling of home there so homeland made in a new place in a host land fifth explores the problems and possibilities caused by experience of diasporic life when you live in diaspora actually you face the problems apart from this basic characteristics there are some features of diasporic literature which we constantly see in this and uh, uh, reflected by the writers home consciousness constantly are uh, recreating their home in their mind then hybrid identity if we talk about the second generation of diaspora that means the children of the first uh, generation of diaspora who were bo- uh, born and brought up in the foreign land they pre- fill hybrid identity they are born and brought up in new land and their parents belong to the homeland so they are confused between their identities search for roots they are constantly searching for their roots they are like as i have said they are feel like a, a trishanku they cannot fit in anywhere Gener- generational conflicts happen modern uh, uh, children uh, children are very modern and parents are still traditional so they don't allow this extramarital affairs in marriages relate love relationship modern way of living alone all these things Uh, create a uh, hurdle in generations lost of self you don't remember your name is suddenly changed from jayshree to jashmin then you feel that i am not the same person so lost of self they, they try to understand their self as a they, even if we adopt the host culture completely then even we are diasporas so that discrimination always remains longing for homeland degradation all these are the features of diasporic literature now how indian diaspora literature began so indian diasporic literature is as old as indian writing in english if we go back to the history of indian writing in english uh, raja ram mohan roy michael madhusudan that all the toru that that family or even shri aurobindo mahatma gandhi nehru all were writing in uh, english and all were writing from foreign countries most of the, them have gone to foreign land for education purpose and they are writing about india in english but it is not the proper beginning of indian diaspora because after some time they have come back to india so the proper beginning of indian diaspora literature can be divided into two types old generation of diaspora writers and new generation of diaspora writers old generation of diaspora writers are such who have born here 
and lived in India for 15, 20 years. And then after their marriage or after some situation with their wish, they have gone abroad and then writing about uh, India. So they fill in betweenness and this in betweenness of space is reflected in their literature. So writers like Kamra, Kamla Markande, Bharti Mukherjee, Anita Desai, Ved Mehta, A.K. Ramanuj, Vikram Sheth, V.S. Naipur, they all are writing about East-West uh, contracts, uh, uh, East-West contacts, how both the cultures mingle in their writing and how they are highlighting Indian culture over Western culture. When we talk about new generation of diaspora writers, new generation of diaspora writers are such who are born in a foreign land, but their parents, their first generation belong to India and they have some connection with India and they are writing about India. So in that we have Jhumpa Lahari, Chitra Banerji, Mina Alexander, Geeta Mehta, Ashish Gupta, Rohintan Mystery. They have connection with the homeland with hybrid identity rather than in betweenness. They feel hybrid identity. So themes and situations, character, all differ a lot in old and new generation diaspora writers. This is all about the introduction of Indian diaspora literature from my side. If you have any questions, I welcome your questions. Madam, Madam, can you suggest? Hello, Madam, can you suggest any particular work time which is recently written by any dash a modern dash for a writer? Wait, we are now. Now you speak. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Continue. The books that I have selected for my research work, like Interpreter of Maladies and the Unaccustomed Earth, then Divakarani Chitra Banerjee Divakarani's work that is arranged marriage, all are recent works that are written in, in last two decades. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, I have one question. Uh, as you have mentioned about uh, Indian diaspora, uh, but when we talk about migration uh, from a native place to another country, uh, there is two types of migration, voluntary and forceful migration. So when we look at African diaspora, uh, mostly they have forceful migration. So do you find any uh, change uh, in uh, experiences of Indian diaspora and African diaspora? Uh, yeah, yeah, you are right. African diaspora is more forced diaspora. Uh, but Indian diaspora in past was also forced to work in the plantation, people were going abroad, but there was a coming back. Now the rules have changed. You can go back to your homeland, but people don't want to go back to their homeland and they try to recreate home in uh, their new land. 
so the basic difference is african diaspora was more forced but they had a chance to go back now in modern times when rules are changed there is a scope of going back so now the answer to all diaspora is that if you have a chance to go home and you want to live in uh, the host land and you recreate your home there that is at the center of all the diasporas okay fine so okay fine so so with this uh, we end uh, this session and very quickly we are starting uh, the third one within 5 minutes just a new set settings i am sending and we are starting our third slot within 5 minutes okay